Here is a vital question. You need to know the answer. Are the ecstatic utterances called gibberish by some observers that boil forth from the mouths of members of some charismatic churches true manifestations of the New Testament gift of tongues? Are they from the Holy Spirit? Or are they, as others would contend, a ridiculous and dangerous counterfeit? This question is of no small importance. Many feel such speaking in tongues is proof one has the Holy Spirit, or at least proof one has some superior level of the Spirit. Is this true? You need to know. Well, the basic doctrine in the Bible, gift of tongues, is the God-given, miraculous ability to speak in a human language that one has not learned in any normal way. It is decidedly not the manifestation of emotional and indecipherable babbling that some charismatic circles today label tongues. The usual teachings of the world, as you can well imagine, is are always diametrically opposite to the Bible. With all the confusion, how can we prove with confidence exactly what the Bible teaching on the tongue is and what it isn't? The process of proving the Bible truth about tongues has three steps listing the common teachings, second, carefully examining all the major Bible verses about tongues and distilling from them all the essential traits of speaking in tongues, and the third step is comparing the common beliefs with the clear biblical record and seeing if the two match or clash. The commonly held false beliefs about the subject form a thick web teeming with pet theories and often contradictory ideas. Often such speaking in tongues under quotation mark, takes place at an emotionally charged religious service called a Terry meeting where the spirit, under quotation mark, is called down or, quotation mark, worked up. Often such working up consists of frenzied repeating of certain phrases like glory, glory, or sweet Jesus. Suddenly, one or two of more, either men or women, are overcome with the spirit and begin shouting gibberish. Usually this includes waving of the arms, jumping, shouting, or even rolling on the floor. One or another of the congregation may rise to interpret, under quotation mark, interpret, what a speaker is saying, usually attributing to the person great utterances of praise for God and other spiritual insights. Some groups view the, this phenomena as absolute proof one has the Spirit of God. Some even believe it is the only proof. Still, others allow that Christians who do not speak in tongues, so to speak, in this manner may have the Spirit, but that those who do speak in tongues have attained to a higher level of the spirit with such speaking. It is a greatly prized spiritual goal in all tongue-speaking circles. Well, some believe that such speaking in tongues is related to the episode of the tongues of fire in Acts chapter 2 verse 3. Others believe it to be the baptism of the spirit predicted by John the Baptist in Matthew 3 verse 11. Beliefs differ too as to whether the utterances mean anything in any language. Some believe the utterances to be the tongues of angels, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1. Others say the languages are unknown and cannot be known. Still others believe such utterances to indeed be known foreign languages spoken today or at least previously known languages such as ancient Hebrew. All who do such speaking take the great pride in the fact that they spoke in tongues, not in what, if anything, they said that might have meant something. But few, it seems, stop and ask themselves whether their gift accords with what the Bible calls tongues. Often such speakers do indeed quote chapter and verse to support their ideas, but usually such quotations are ripped entirely out of context and explained illogically. What we look carefully at the main verses, however, a clear picture would emerge. So when we look carefully at the main verses in the Bible, a clear picture emerges. What are the Bible teachings about the tongues? Well, here it is. The place to begin is Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. The verses in this passage from form the crux of the Bible doctrine of tongues. Here recorded is the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit. After the death of Christ, believers were assembled on the day of Pentecost 
when a mighty wind filled the room, fire descended upon them, and they began to speak in tongues. The Apostle Peter then spoke in tongues to others who were gathered in Jerusalem, and all marveled at the gift. Such a brief summary at first might seem to support the beliefs of the Charismatics. But look closer, please look closer. Note that this was not a Terry meeting, but a church service on Pentecost, a holiday the Bible commands true Christians to keep in Leviticus 23 verses 15 through 21. Pentecost was a day, a holiday, not an event. Secondly, and those who advocate Terry meetings simply misunderstand Christ's command for the apostles to wait in Jerusalem till the Spirit was given. In Luke, that was the instruction of Christ in Luke 24 verse 49. The word Terry in this verse comes from the Middle English Tarien, meaning wait. Modern translations bear this out. Thirdly, Further, Acts chapter 2 verse 2 shows a wind filled the whole house suddenly. It was a wind that made a noise, and it was sudden. It was not that their mouths gradually worked up a wind. Further, the tongues of fire were not the tongues in their mouths, but small burning fires. Notice also that all were filled with the Spirit, not just one, and not just some. And most importantly, see that the tongues Peter spoke in were known languages of the day that were clearly understood by those listening. The listeners marveled because Peter in their ears seemed to be speaking in their native local dialects, although he obviously hadn't learned all these languages by going to school or through some other normal method of study. Peter was not speaking unintelligible gibberish. Further, we see no descriptions of wildly gyrating bodies, waving hands or rolling on the ground. Before leaving the book of Acts, we must examine one more instance of speaking in tongues, this time in Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 48. This happened in the house of Cornelius. It was on the occasion of the first outpouring of God's Spirit to the Gentiles. The account is brief, but verse 46 clearly states that those listening heard, those speaking in tongues, magnify God. The only conclusion is that these tongues, again, were known languages of the day. In Acts chapter 19, verse 1 through 6, it relates a similar episode. The book of 1 Corinthians has much to say about tongues. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 and 10, they mention the gift. The verses 27 through 31 are the most crucial. In verse 28, Paul lists the governmental offices of the church, including apostle. Then, beginning in verse 29, through a series of rhetorical questions, Paul emphatically proves that not all have the gift of tongues, or any of a number of other gifts for that matter. Clearly, having the gift of tongues cannot be the only proof one has God's Spirit. Nor is it proof of superior righteousness, for verse 31, coupled with 1 Corinthians 13, declares unabashedly that love is a greater gift of the Spirit than speaking in tongues. 1 Corinthians 13.1 says that even if one has the power to speak in the tongues of angels, he is spiritually worthless unless he has love. These are strong words indeed, and should once and for all lower tongues from any imaginary position of superiority among gifts of the Spirit. And these verses do not imply that the Corinthians spoke in angelic language. For in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 and 2, Paul lists numerous incredible feats, all of them beyond the capability of men, such as moving mountains with faith and understanding every single mystery of life. He wanted the Corinthians to see that even if they could do certain things far beyond their normal abilities, it still wouldn't make them righteous unless they were filled with and expressing God's love. It is clear that he spoke of the tongues of angels also as something beyond their current abilities, just like moving mountains. 1 Corinthians 14 is a crucial chapter, for it is devo devoted entirely to the topic of tongues. Be sure to review every word of this chapter on your own. Numerous points stand out and with great force defeat the arguments of modern tongue speakers. To begin, 
The same Greek word for tongues used in Acts is also used here, not some different word. Further, the overwhelming conclusion is that Paul wrote these words to downplay and control the gift of tongues, not to extol it. The first verse of the chapter unceremoniously dethrones tongues from a position of preeminence among gifts since it encourages normal, inspired preaching called prophesying in the authorized version over the gift of tongues. The next verse Time and again, stress the, that the purpose of speaking in tongues is to edify the audience, not the speaker. This, of course, is vastly different from modern Terry meetings and the like, where the one who speaks in tongues is the center of attention, while the audience just sits back and watches the show. No real edification takes place. Verses 10 through 17 stress the need for the audience to understand the words and thus make plain that the words are capable of being understood. Clearly, Paul is writing of common human languages of the day. Verse 23 makes the same point in a different way. Paul warns against speaking in a language that audience doesn't understand, saying that to do so would make one who is an unbeliever or unlearned think the believers were crazy. After all, what sense does it make to speak French to an audience if the audience doesn't know French, or Serbian, or English, or any other language for that matter? When Paul says an unlearned person would be confused, he tacitly is saying that a learned person would not be confused. It is abundantly clear that these languages were real ones that could be learned. The remaining verse verses in this chapter drive the final nails into the coffin of the modern misunderstanding. Verse 27 limits the number who may speak in tongues at any one time to two or three who must take turns. It demands calm order in the service, the very opposite of the emotionally charged atmosphere of a Terry meeting. Verse 28 requires the tongues to be translated for those who do not understand. If there is no translator, then no speaking in tongues is allowed, period. Verse 31 demands tongues be used one by one in turn, not at the same time in confusion. Verse 32 states that the one who speaks in tongues is at all times in control of himself. This is the very opposite of modern speakers who give themselves over to tongues and are for a while controlled by the phenomena so much so that they may not remember or even knew what they said. Finally, women are forbidden by Paul to preach in the church at all, let alone use tongues, verse 34, such is not so today, when many, if not most of the speakers, are indeed women. We now have listed the main beliefs about modern speaking in tongues, and we have examined the pertinent Bible verses and extracted the key points. How obvious it is that modern tongues and biblical tongues are not merely different, they are indeed opposites. The Bible tongues are real languages, modern tongues are not. One is always under control, the other is worked up to uncontrolled frenzy. One is in turn by two or three at most, the other is disorderly and confused. One must always have a, an interpreter, the other may not. One is for instruction, the other for display and self-glory. One is at a preaching service where people are to be edified by the content of the speech, the other is at an emotional Terry meeting. One is vocal only, the other is linked with wild physical movement. To be fair, some modern tongue speakers do claim their languages, their tongues are real languages, and some claim to interpret. Impartial studies, however, have shown that such claims are not supported by the facts. Often, only a few words or phrases of a real foreign language are detected in the ecstatic utterances and if spoken only by accident, and so-called interpretations of same tongue-speaking episodes often very wildly, very widely and are very general even then. Further, John the Baptist's reference to the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Matthew 3.11 does not refer to tongues as some separate baptism in addition to one's initial receipt of the Holy Spirit. It is indeed a reference to that very act of receiving God's Spirit after repentance which baptizes us into the Church of God or into the basically spiritual body of Christ, as we have explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. The final two remaining questions are why God ever gave 
the gift of tongues, and whether the genuine gift exists today. Well, no doubt the gift of tongues was for the same purpose as other miraculous manifestations in the early church, to call attention to the initial outpouring of God's power, to attract attention to the gospel message, not to the speaker, and to spread the gospel in a part of the world peppered with people who spoke many different languages. Despite claims to the contrary, people today are not seen to speak miraculously in languages. They did not learn it the normal way. But the prophecy of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28 to 32, cited by Peter in Acts, chapter 2, verses 16 to 21, may indicate God's servants will again exercise that gift at a time of God's own choosing yet future. When and if that happens, God's church will, of course, acknowledge it, while it also recognizes such a thing as one of the lesser gifts of the Spirit. The key verses about the tongue question is, that the main verses about this subject, they fall into a few easily remembered sections of Scripture. Acts chapter 2, verse 1-21, through 21, the first outpouring of tongues occurred on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 10, verses 44-48, the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit of, on Gentiles is described. For Corinthians chapter 12, various scattered statements about tongues. And First Corinthians chapter 14 is Paul's instruction about and limitations regarding tongues. In conclusion, friends, as with so many other subjects, once again, we have seen that despite their sincerity, people can be led far away from the truth when they allow their own thoughts and emotions and evil spiritual influences to dictate their beliefs rather than God's precious word.